All right, this evening let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we will look at uh, God's path to uh, manhood here, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I'd like to uh, take a look, a quick overview of this passage before we go through it and uh, kind of try to uh, organize it seem, seemingly the way that the uh, Holy Spirit gave it. If we look at um, the first nine verses, they form the first part of this passage. They form one uh, unified theme. Uh, they're dealing with um, men of this world or men that are living uh, in these last days according to the last days. And then verse 10 begins uh, a contrast. We see the word but there, and the contrast is the way that the men of the last days live versus uh, the way that Paul's life was lived, uh, verses uh, 10 uh, all the way down through um, verse uh, 13. And then Paul gives uh, some commands to uh, Timothy here uh, in uh, 14 through 17 for Timothy's development into uh, manhood. And uh, we see the word man or men uh, mentioned in uh, verse 2, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, and it goes on, we'll look at those. And we also see the word man mentioned in verse 17. So the passage begins and ends with uh, men, and it's two different types of men that are contrasted here. And so um, the word in verse 17 is the man of God. Uh, we don't need to uh, get confused and think that that refers necessarily to someone that is uh, ordained or in full-time service. Uh, the word man of God here uh, is applicable to any man that is possessed by God, or that is God's man, and uh, God's man uh, can uh, be, uh, these traits and this path uh, can be uh, achieved by any man. Uh, of course, God calls men to special service and calls men into the ministry. That's just not necessarily all that is meant here in verse 17. Uh, so that is how this passage lays out verses 1 through 9, the description of what men of the flesh or men of the world or men of these days are doing. And then verses 10 through 17 gives us, uh, as in opposition to that, how should we then live? So I'm hoping that we can take these truths, these uh, Bible truths, and apply them into our homes for both the raising of our boys uh, and of our girls. They are mentioned here as well. But, but even beyond that... Um, it's certainly true that I think as uh, we are trying to raise our children, God sometimes raises us too. And God sometimes uh, builds us uh, through the teaching that we're trying to get across to, to our families. So I hope that it can affect and be a blessing to all of us here this evening. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get into this lesson. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, and I thank you, God, that you give us this passage and uh, the truth that's in it, Lord, is timeless, uh, given... Uh, many hundred years ago, and Lord, the fact of the matter is that through history, men have either chosen to accept uh, your uh, way to manhood or they've rejected it, and Lord, uh, reap the results of it. I pray that uh, each of us might be challenged by the words that you give, and uh, Lord, that we would um, apply these things as we need in our own homes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So in verse 1, we have here uh, Paul giving this uh, description last days. In the last days, perilous times shall come. Uh, what are the last days? Well, let's turn to Acts chapter 2. Keep your finger in 2 Timothy 2. We're going to be looking at a lot of verses tonight. Acts chapter 2, verse 17, help us out with what uh, God's uh, view or God's description of the last days are. I think uh, that uh, when we hear it's the last days, um, the tendency maybe for us is to think that it's never been, no one else has ever thought it's the last days. We just, man, it's really, 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 really bad, so we're in the last days. What we find is men that have been uh, close to the Lord and preaching have felt it's been the last days since Jesus went to heaven. In fact, here's what the Bible says um, in Acts 2, look at verse 15. 
It's uh, the day of Pentecost. And Jesus has went to heaven 10 days before this passage. Verse 15, for these are not drunken, as you suppose, seen as but the third hour of the day, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And then it goes on to quote Joel, and uh, then Peter begins his message. So according to this passage, in one sense, the last days began 10 days after Jesus went to heaven. So the last days have been here for a while. Uh, they've been here, and we know that they've been the last days in the sense that Jesus could come at any time. And uh, the coming of Christ is imminent. So back to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now we know that the last days, perilous times, are going to come. These are difficult times. What, what makes a time hard or difficult? One uh, Bible commentator about uh, several hundred years ago said, this is when a time becomes perilous for men, when religion is a form. We'll see that in verse 5. When truth is forsaken, when the world mixes with God's people. Those are perilous. Those are dangerous, difficult times. When outward duties are maintained despite inward decay. That is perilous times. And he went on to say that perilous times don't only affect and come to a culture, they also can come to an individual. Times can be perilous as a culture. Yes, we look around, it's bad. That kind of protects us from making it personal in our own lives. And this man uh, wisely, I think, says watch out for that because personally, individually, we can come to perilous times in our own lives. And so the last day's warnings is not just for that all out there. It's for us, too. It's our own warning as well. Last days, we know, eventually are going to end up in the elevation of man. We read Revelation 13. We read about the mark of the beast. We read about the Antichrist. That is the glorification of man. That's where our whole world is heading. We know where it's heading. God tells us. In Revelation. So, as we see men become more and more centered on, focused on themselves and lifting themselves up, we do see signs that we are heading toward the fulfillment of prophecy and that day when a man, the Antichrist, can take over the world. How can the world be so blinded by that? Well, that's where this world is heading the ultimate man, the Antichrist. And so we move into verse 2, and we find out some character traits, verses 2 through 4, of these men during the last days, whether it's an entire culture or an individual. And so <clears throat> there are 18 of these character traits, verses 2 through 4. I'm going to move quickly, and I've grouped them together. There's going to be an issue with what this man loves Okay, first off, lovers of their own selves. Okay, they will love themselves. Secondly, they will be covetous. This is really a lover of silver or a lover of money. That's what that uh, means there, a, a friend of money. And uh, later on in the list, we see that they will love pleasures. We see that there in verse 4. Uh, this is hedonism. They'll love pleasures more than they love God. And then... Uh, what they don't love is those that are good. They despise those that are good. So those are four of the traits that deal with what a man in the last days loves. Secondly, uh, we have four traits here that deals with a man's pride. In this list, we uh, see here that the last days men will be boasters. This is pride through their words. And then uh, another word in this list is proud. This is has to do with comparing one uh, man to another man in order to lift himself up, to lift himself up above his fellow men. And then also uh, we have uh, the word in verse 4, heady. Heady here has to do with making rash decisions. And then high-minded. And uh, this uh, literally can mean drunk with pride, just Pride has filled a man so much that uh, 
He, he's drunk. He's lost his uh, capacity for clear thinking. This happened at the time of the flood. This happened at the Tower of Babel. And this is happening and will happen in the end times. And so pride, uh, one man said pride is probably the easiest sin to fall into, which is why we defend it so much. It is the original sin. Pride is dangerous. In this list, we have the word, uh, we have a warning against words. These are the words blasphemers. We see that there in verse 2. Blasphemer is uh, someone using words for the purpose of destroying someone's reputation. Let's look at Acts chapter 6, verse 11. Acts 6, 11, blasphemer. And here we have uh, Stephen, the uh, early Christian. And uh, verse 10, he was wise. They were not able to resist the wisdom which he spake. And so they suborned or gathered men which said, we heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses. Okay, so this idea of blasphemy is uh, here was a lie against Stephen, but the idea was that he was slandering. He was saying uh, words that destroyed Moses' reputation. Back to our passage. I'm moving quickly through this list. We also have false accusers listed there. And the word false accusers there, you might recognize the, the word behind this is diabolos, or the devil. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. That's this word. And Satan has slandered God in paradise, and he hasn't stopped since. So words are an issue. Words used wrongly here are character traits of these last days men. Let's look at James chapter 3. James chapter 3, we have an interesting marriage of different terms here in James 3. In verse 6, we have the word hell. In verse 6, we have the word fire. In verse 15, we have the word devilish. And through the whole chapter, we have the way that words are used. What an interesting connection of words. Hell, fire, devilish, all connected with our words. The tongue is set on fire of hell. Back again to 2 Timothy 3. There's issues here with the family. We see that the last days men will be disobedient to their parents. That's pretty self-explanatory. But then also we have the phrase beginning with verse 3, without natural affection. Without natural affection briefly means without, it doesn't mean, it's, this is not uh, the term that's used to describe homosexuality. This is the term used to describe uh, without family love or hard-hearted toward family or with a brute uh, uh, idea in family relations. This deals with potentially the love of wife to husband, husband to wife, children to parents. All right? We are not animals, therefore we have a love in our family, should have a love in our family, and God commands husbands, uh, of course, to love their wives, but there should be a natural affection. Um, but when man lifts himself up so high, even that most basic instinct of affection gets pushed aside. Two other terms dealing with a man's view of God are unthankful and unholy. An unthankful is an attack on God's lordship. Unholy is an attack on the very nature of God. Two last, uh, two last uh, divisions here. Truce breakers and traitors. Okay, truce breakers and traitors. A truce breaker is a person who refuses to listen to terms of reconciliation. Uh, Thomas Koch's commentary said this, men who once offended will come to no treaty of reconciliation. And a traitor um, is the idea of a betrayer. So those two words taken together are pretty interesting. Truce breaker and traitor. It's a man unwilling to end a conflict, truce breaker, yet willing to betray one of his own in the conflict, a traitor. What, what's the issue with both men? The self is elevated. And then we have the issue of self-control. That's the word incontinent. Uh, this is a man self-indulgent to himself, 
followed up by the very next word, which is what? Fierce. That is having no self-control toward those uh, around him. So he indulges himself, and he's fierce and unrelenting toward others. In reality, shouldn't it be the opposite? We should be stronger on ourselves and patient with others. Uh, and so this uh, self-control, incontinent and fierce. I uh, got lucky at a used bookstore recently and found a book by uh, Henry Cope, who was born in England, and he went to Spurgeon's church, and he went to Spurgeon's college. He was very interested in religious education for youth. And, of course, at this time, religious education was still worked through what we would say the public school system. There was no Christian school movement. And so he was very interested in getting God's word and, and, and getting religion into the schools that everybody went to. And so he wrote many books, and, and Spurgeon encouraged him to come to America, where there were many opportunities for him to get uh, into this realm. And he did. He, he started off in Montana. And after being out there for a little while, <clears throat> he realized I'd, probably there's no one there, for one thing. But he also realized that Chicago, at the turn of the century, was becoming an educational hub. And so he came, and interestingly enough, he hooked up with the very earliest uh, leaders uh, at the University of Chicago, which was, again, founded as a Baptist institution. And, and he wanted to use the influence through that to push the Bible into the public school system. And he um, worked for years, uh, about uh, 20 years, in that realm. He wrote many books, but this book he wrote trying to help people, that, and this, this is, was printed in 1930, it was its 13th printing, this book. It was first printed in 1915. So, 100 year celebration for this book, right? Never heard of it. I hadn't either. Religious education in the family. It's, it's great. He, he, he helps people. He says, you know, you don't know how to do the family altar. Here, here's a suggestion. Here's, here's every day of the week, and here's some things you can do each day to get uh, the family altar going in your house. Well, on Sunday, uh, you do this on Monday pray and, and read this verse. It's, re, it's very practical and, and helpful. Uh, and he was known for being that. He was not known uh, for being um, educated, overly educated. He didn't even graduate from Spurgeon's College, never graduated really from a school. Um, but he, he deals with this idea of self-control uh, in the book. And uh, <clears throat> I'm just going to read uh, two, two or three quick uh, sections. Step by step, dealing with each excitement of anger, train your boys in self-control. Self-mastery is a matter of learning to direct and apply our powers at will. It is developed by habitual practice. It's the largest general element in character. That patience which self-control saves, uh, the immensely valuable dynamic of the emotions and harnesses them into a godlike service. So you can harness, you can harness energy and service if there's self-control. On the other hand, anger against persons is the opportunity for learning the joy of forgiveness, and if the occasion warrants, the dignity and courage of the apology. The self-control, consideration, and social adjustment involved must be learned early in life. It is part of that great lesson of the fine art of living with others. Little children must be habituated to acknowledging errors and acts of rudeness or temper with suitable forms of apology. Above all, they must, by habit, learn how great is the victory of forgiveness. And then he goes on and, and he gives uh, 10 or 12 books here along that topic that had been written and were available for people that were concerned about uh, their families at that day. So interesting uh, little find there. And he, and he understands and recognizes that self-control is the, is the general principle that controls everything else in our life. Uh, so these are the traits of the men of the last days. And uh, <clears throat> what uh, we'll move past verse 5 for just a moment and come back to it. Verse 6, we see the actions of a person that has these traits. What do they do? We know what, they, what, they, what, what their traits are, but what do they do? Verse 6, of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts. They have problem with women. They creep. They sneak the word sneak, sneaking away from the eyes of authority and accountability. Silly women, they find. Last day's men connect up with silly women. All right, this has to do with little women, not in size, but little in character. 
And so these character traits, they're going to go find someone that has similar character trait of having little character. Silly women seem to be attracted to men with these traits and vice versa. Among other places, you can see that um, in Hollywood, can you not? They lead captive. All right, so he, this woman, silly, gets imprisoned captive by this person. You reap what you sow. Then um, there's another problem, verse 7, an action, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Here's what Adam Clark a couple hundred years ago said about that verse. There are many professors of Christianity still who answer the above description. They hear, repeatedly hear, good sermons, but as they seldom meditate on what they hear, they derive little profit from the ordinances of God. They have no more grace now than they had several years ago, though hearing all the while, and perhaps not wickedly departing from the Lord, but they do not meditate. They do not think. They do not reduce what they hear to practice, even under the preaching of an apostle. And so that was uh, recognized a couple hundred years ago by a man who was a burden for people that uh, were ever learning and yet never able to come to the knowledge of the truth because it was just words. It was never brought down to, okay, here's what I need to do. Here's how I need to respond. And then we move to verse 8. Now as Jannies and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Let's turn back to Exodus chapter 7. Another trait that's uh, evident here in these last days is this issue with withstanding authority. <clears throat> Jannies and Jambres, their names are not listed here in Exodus, but they are throughout um, Jewish history books. And they are uh, cited there as the magicians that stood in Egypt against Moses and against uh, Aaron. And so we have these men withstanding Moses. Uh, Exodus chapter 7 verse 11 says, Then Pharaoh called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now the magicians of Egypt, they did also in like manner with their enchantments. What did they do? Well, they turned their rods into snakes. Verse 12, they cast on every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. So from the very first challenge uh, about God's authority, the magicians had to be thinking to their head, in, in their mind, hmm, there's two uh, snakes crawling around there. They both were once rods, and Aaron's rod, Aaron's snake ate our snake. So authority, even that very first challenge was established. Well, it kept going. Uh, look at uh, verse uh, 22. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments. What did they do? Uh, well, they uh, here turned water to blood. So the magicians did that. Eight, chapter 8, verse 7. And the magicians did so with their enchantments. They made frogs appear. Look at verse 19, verse 18. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice upon man and upon beast. And look at what the Egypt, uh, magicians said after that. Verse 19, then the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. Now we're going to understand the magicians were polytheists in, in uh, uh, Egypt. They worshipped many gods. But here they recognized what was going on. They said, this is God's finger. God did this. And uh, <clears throat> Pharaoh refused to stop, and the magicians refused to stop standing against God's authority. And so we move to chapter 9 and verse 10 and see what happened there. <clears throat> and they took the ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses sprinkled it up toward heaven, and it became a boil, breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. For the boil was upon the magicians. They rejected, rejected, rejected the authority, even though they knew it was God's authority, and then eventually the boil came up on them. So back to 2 Timothy 3. This is Janice and Jamri. They withstood Moses. They withstood authority. Why? Because they had elevated themselves. They were elevating themselves against God. Why did they do this? They were verse 8 men of men of corrupt minds the bible says 
men of corrupt minds. The word corrupt means made unreliable by a change from the original condition. And that could happen to any of us in our mind. We can all become changed from our original condition um, if we let these traits sneak in. Reprobate. Reprobate. Uh, the word prove in 1 Thessalonians 5.21. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. That's a tremendous uh, trait for a Christian to have, isn't it? To be able to prove what's going on in this world and hold fast that which is good. Reprobate is the opposite of the word prove. It's the exact opposite. So when a person is reprobate, they no longer have the discernment to be able to prove that which is good, prove all things and hold fast that which is good. They've lost that ability to do that. And so as we're raising our children, we want them to be able to grow in their discernment. Well, to grow in their discernment, we need to work these bad traits out of their life, and we need to bring in the good traits that we're going to look at here in uh, just a little bit. So in summary here, uh, many say uh, about verse 6, the lust problem. Well, that's manly to, be, to have lust. What is manly? It's last day's man. Manly, And it's uh, manly here to uh, have open mind about uh, things and, you know, uh, take God's word or leave it in verse 7. What's, it is manly. It's last day's man, manly. And then also in verse 8, it's manly to stand up to God's authority. Well, yes, it is uh, for the last day's man, not for God's man. And uh, we see now verse 5, all of this, all these traits and all these actions are wrapped up in an interesting package. Look at verse 5. Having a form of godliness, all these traits and all these actions come looking godly, looking like uh, it is spiritual. The problem is denying the power thereof. Right? <clears throat> so the magicians could recreate the form of the snake when they threw it down there, standing before Moses, but they could not obtain the power of the snake. And eventually, verse 9, their folly will be manifest to all men. And uh, God, Matthew Poole says, God will preserve those in his church that are sincere. Though, though others may captivate a four uh, a, a may captivate a few poor, ignorant women, they will not have great success in God's church. So these deceivers will captivate a few <laughs> poor, ignorant women, according to this commentary, but their folly will be made manifest. Folly there means senselessness. Lack of good sense or lack of Bible sense. So as we are raising our children, we want them to have good, clear sense, common sense, Bible sense. And so we have to fight these traits and we have to look for these actions and we have to deal with them as they uh, come, come about. Um, <clears throat> John Gill said, they may proceed to more ungodliness and wax worse and worse in error, but they won't go any further than the magicians of Egypt, who did lying wonders. They hardened Pharaoh's heart, but they could not destroy the Israelites, could they? They're, the Red Sea still parted for God's people. God's people still went across, and eventually the, the army of Pharaoh was what? Cast into the sea. They cannot deceive God's people nor destroy the church of God the gates of hell cannot even prevail against that. And so uh, we move now, very quickly, to the character traits of God's man. Verse 10, but thou hast fully known my, and here's the list, doctrine, manner of life. Isn't that interesting? Paul said, you knew, you knew what I taught, and you knew how I applied it. You saw me. You saw me in Ephesus. You saw me in Iconium. You saw me all the way through. You, you, you knew my doctrine. You knew my manner of life. You knew my purpose as sincere, genuine. You saw my faith. You saw me be long-suffering. Albert Barnes says, long-suffering with the evil passions of others and their efforts to try to injure him. 
Think of Paul being stoned at Iconium. Remember one of the first places he went to on a missionary journey? He got stoned. He rose back up from that and walked away. You don't see him going out and throwing stones back at those people, do you? I wonder if he just never forgot the fact that not too many, maybe years, maybe months before, he was standing by while Stephen got stoned and was consenting to his death. And so he's long-suffering with those even that were stoning him because he realized God's grace had, he was there, he was on that side just not that long ago. And so his long-suffering uh, was evident to Timothy who saw Paul not um, throw those stones back at that time. I'm sure among many other things too. And he also said, you know my charity. All right. By the time 2 Timothy 3 is written, I wanted to read a passage from 1 Corinthians 13, but you can read that later. 1 Corinthians 13 is already written. And Paul defines charity there many times through that passage. And he said, Timothy, you know the charity uh, that I had and my patience and uh, a calm temper which suffers evil without murmuring and discontent. He said, you also knew, verse 11, my persecutions and afflictions, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, what persecutions I endured. There's a character trait, endurance, endurance. And uh, <clears throat> endurance is <clears throat> a test of God's man. So is doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, charity, patience, long-suffering. But the Lord delivered me, verse 12, and verse uh, 11, verse 12, yea, and all that will of godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Verse uh, 14 through 16, here he tells Timothy, continue in the things which you've learned and been assured of, knowing of whom you've learned them. Verse 15, what did he know? He knew the holy scriptures. He knew the scriptures from a young child. From who? He knew them from his mother and from his grandmother. He did not know them, apparently, from Scripture from his father. Seems to be a lost Gentile man. So here's some encouragement for those that are in a home without a father. Timothy came from that home, and he had a faithful mother and a faithful grandmother who went to God's Word to give him, make him a man, and who also had Timothy... Uh, with a Paul in his life to help make him a man. And so we have hope here for uh, that situation. And uh, he knew this from a child. Well, that tells us there was a lot of Bible going on in that home. There was a lot of time uh, uh, applying uh, that command to, 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 to speak God's word uh, in the home uh, along the way. And he knew this from a child. And what did he know about Scripture? He knew, six, verse 16, that all of it was given by God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. righteousness. The result, verse 17. The result of this is a man of God that is perfect, not sinless, but perfect. That word means complete. It's the idea of a man going to build something, and he has every tool that he needs with him to build that. He has all the tools necessary. It's the idea of stepping into a house, and that house is fully furnished out. It has everything inside the house that is needed. It's fully furnished. All the tools for the job are there, fully, completely ready for what? God's work in his life. Fit for the task. Now, this is Timothy when he's young. Think about Moses. Moses was fully furnished or fit for the task when? When he was young? Nope. How about when he was 40 years old? Nope. How about when he was 80? Yes. So being fit for the task is possible for boys that are young, for teenagers, for young adults, for middle age, and I'm not going to use the bad word, but for people that are past middle age, anybody can get refit, anybody can get refurnished for the work that lies ahead. Timothy was young, God used him. Moses was not young, 
But from the age of 80 until he passed away, think about what Moses did. Why? He let God's word have his way in his life, and he was fit. And so we see this world's men. <laughs> we don't want anything to do with that. We better know what the traits are. We better know what the actions are. We better watch ourselves. We teach our children. And then we see God's way to manhood. It's not easy. It's persecutions. It's afflictions. It's long-suffering. It's patience. It's charity. It's endurance. But in the end, God's work gets done by someone fully ready for it, if we'll embrace this. Lord, we thank you for your word and just pray that it might be helpful to some in here. We all want to raise our boys for you. We want to raise our girls to uh, spend their lives married to a man that's following you, not a man sucked in by this world system. No matter what the age of anyone in here, help us to realize there's always the opportunity for us to get fit or refit for your service. Help us to take that as a challenge as we look into 2015 and at the great opportunities that lie ahead for Fairhaven Baptist Church. Bless the prayer time to follow in Jesus' name. Amen.